In 20 years of hard work and struggle at Harper's Ferry, Maine native John Harris Hall labored at his rifle works to achieve a world-changing goal, the first ever mechanized volume manufacture of an object, each of which having truly interchangeable parts. It was the breech-loading rifle he did it on, but those who saw what he did spread the good news like wildfire using Hall's extremely challenging method, taking and employing Hall's ideas and other arms plants. Only the best, like James Henry Burton, replicated the operation to best effect. Soon, the method, the American factory system, caught the attention of the manufacturing giants in England. Then, after the Civil War, the system of actual machines and the accompanying concept of gauges were directly converted to countless other things that have since filled and defined our daily lives, leading to the way everything is produced today around the world, except what the artisan still beautifully makes by hand and what the farmer conjures out of nature. Beautiful craft and art and food from the land remain valued, but Hall's system is used to make things, things, from simple paper clips to space stations. We got two approach. Roger that. John Harris Hall, who died exhausted in 1841, never saw the true wonder of his efforts, namely, production of a rifle on a truly vast scale, so evident to us today. So forgotten is this history-making man that no image is yet surfaced of him, and the weeds around his grave and his wife's grave in a lonely small Missouri plot. Methods of gun making, when unveiled at the precedent setting exposition at London's Crystal Palace in 1851, left the Brits stunned by these broad advances and scrambling for answers. They dispatched a delegation to look at these publicly available inventions, look for potential hirelings, and they returned with a trove of arms making equipment valued at close to $100,000. By the late 1840s and up to the Civil War, the Springfield Armory became a clearinghouse of new ideas of every stripe. Tool machine companies sprouted up around Springfield. James Henry Burton, who was born in 1823 at nearby Shannondale Springs near Harpers Ferry, and one-time machinist and master armorer there, understood the innovations. Hall's Rifle Works, Burton later wrote, housed not an occasional machine, but a plant of milling machinery by which the system and economy of the manufacture was materially altered. In the 1850s, Burton 
was hired to set up a rifle making factory in England for Enfield rifles that were used on both sides during the Civil War. Burton later set up the Confederate Arms Works at Richmond, where much of the machinery at Harper's Ferry had been moved to in April 1861. Gunsmith Eric Johnson today calls Burton the rock star of the Civil War era arms manufacturers, and who innovated even more, especially in the nature of the mini ball. When I look at this piece, and when I look at the Model 1841, an individual's name comes to mind. Uh, for lack of a better term, he's kind of a rock star of the armory system <laughs> in the Annabelle America. In America. Uh, his name was James Henry Burton. James Henry Burton uh, started his career in, in, in Harper's Ferry and also he had worked in Apprentice in Baltimore and, and in other places. Uh, he became quite a machinist and an excellent engineer. And he uh, was so adept at what he did that his services were later sought. Uh, he actually ended up going to England. And the ironies of this is that he ends up teaching the, uh, the folks in England at Enfield how to produce a, a, a rifled musket using American machinery and American tools and the American manufacturing system. Um, and, and that's sort of a turn of events uh, because it was England who spawned the, the so-called Industrial Revolution. Well, here, uh, the Americans have turned it around and, and we have created, beginning with John Hall and Simeon North and with Eli Whitney, a whole system and a whole idea of machine making firearms and doing it in mass production and doing it with, again, interchangeable parts. And Burton is, is the result of that. He becomes someone who has come up through the system uh, by the 1840s and 1850s, certainly, he knows the system inside and out. Uh, and, and he understands how to set up a factory, how to make it work, and, and how to, to uh, make things progress so that you can produce large numbers of rifles and muskets. Later on, uh, Burton would, when the, the, the county of Jefferson did secede with the state of Virginia uh, and become part of the Confederacy, he became, in a sense, one of the founding engineers and armorers for the Confederate armory system. If you look at his history, he helped to found Macon, he helped to found Fayetteville, the, the, the Richmond Armory, um, Spiller and Burr. Oh my gosh, I can think of lots and lots and lots of other Confederate ordnance, small arms ordnance that Burton had a hand in. But his, his knowledge and his engineering opinions were, were valuable. After the Civil War, when government contracts dried up almost as quickly as a desert flower after a spring rain, the endless era of adapting gun manufactories to other similar production began. Lucien Sharp hired the esteemed manufacturer Robinson Lawrence to make his widely used Sharps rifles before the war using these state-of-the-art processes. In 1873, the Weed Sewing Machine Company bought out the Sharps factory and converted the gun making equipment to making sewing machines. Albert Pope took his idea in 1878 to the president of Weed Sewing Company, proposing that Weed make English high wheeler bikes that Pope would sell. Business boomed as Pope then diversified into the long-standing Columbia brand American-style bicycle, motorcycles, and an early version of the automobile, all again benefiting from the mechanized and gauge-based methods first realized by Hall. This manufacturing process that started with Hall was adapted to make cars when the Duryea brothers did just that around Springfield in the 1890s, even battery-powered cars. Of course, Henry Ford took mass production much further with the use of electricity to run a moving assembly line. The momentum continues today from Hall's days of heroic achievement at Harper's Ferry in the 1820s 
Maybe the terrible, moistened, dust-filled air in his grinding room contributed, but his health had begun to fail by the late 1830s. In 1840, he and his family took permanent leave of absence. He died February 26, 1841, in Moberly, Missouri. The next 60 years alone had proven the ever-expanding influence of this American way of making shoes, Waltham watches, clocks, bicycles, clothing, rubber goods, and automobiles. Today, becoming the way things are made generally. In fact, the structure of modern software code echoes John Hall. According to Wendell Pease, a leading consultant in extensible markup languages, Hall's use of gauges parallels a key feature of standard computer code called the verification layer. On October 7th of the year of Hall's death in 1841, his widow, Satira Hall, who would die 13 years later, wrote Colonel Talcott at the Ordnance Department in Washington, reflecting on what her husband's heroic sacrifice and patriotism meant. No one can know as I do the great sacrifices of both comfort and interest he has made. No one but myself can imagine his days of toil and nights of anxiety while inventing and perfecting his machinery. Never did he for one minute hesitate to sacrifice his own interest when he thought it would interfere with the interests of the government. Had he in 1820 listened to the proposals of foreign governments, he might now be enjoying health and prosperity. Yet he refused, all because he thought by so doing he should benefit his own government. But the magnitude of Hall's dual achievement of ushering in precision mass production he did not see because his jealous foes at the armory and in Washington often shrank his budget and sabotaged his operation, making the production of his rifle on a significantly larger scale impossible. Today, the seeming unlimited scale ability of any manufacturer, taken further by computerization and nanotechnology, leaves those among the living in 2015 most appreciative and even sometimes awestruck. Even more recently, friends and family visited the weed-choked graveyard with the stones for John and Satira Hall to pull the weeds away and restore their dignity for such a visionary man.